at Harvard University, there was a wealthy and handsome professor who stubbornly argued with a small restaurant owner over four dollars. The owner endured and endured until he couldn't endure no more. Years passed. Care to guess who had the last laugh in the end? This tale unfolds in Boston, known as the Athens of America, a region boasting some of the highest concentration of intellectuals, including Harvard and MIT. With scholars around the globe, it gradually became a culinary hub, offering not only Boston lobster, but numerous family-run eateries featuring exotic cuisine. These restaurants are especially popular among the homesick students who gather around to get a taste of their homeland. One such eatery was Sichuan restaurant named Sichuan Garden. Despite its unassuming exterior and simple furnishings, it was a renowned establishment that had been serving customers for 18 years. Its former owner, Old Duan, was a native of Sichuan, which reflected in a menu featuring authentic Sichuan dishes alongside Americanized Chinese cuisine, like broccoli beef and General Tso's chicken. Old Duan, known for his amiable demeanor, delighted Chinese students with his authentic Sichuan dishes and even prepared genuine spicy hot pot upon request. Quest. Contrary to the stereotype of a burly chef, Old Duan was refined and elegant. Little did many know, he was a renowned tenor in China who had studied Western opera at Boston University years ago, then transitioned from opera to culinary arts. This transformation stemmed not only from the practical consideration, but also from a deep-rooted passion for food. This passion was inherited by his son, Ran Duan, who, after graduating in hotel management, took over his father's beloved restaurant, becoming the student's beloved Little Duan. However, this modest Chinese restaurant faced trouble in 2014 over a mere $4. One day, Ben Edelman, a Harvard professor, ordered garlic chicken, spicy peanut shrimp, boiled fish slices, and stir-fried cabbage from, from Sichuan Garden using an online ordering platform for pickup. The total bill came to $53.35. Upon returning home and inspecting the receipt, he noticed the discrepancy. The online order was supposed to be under $50, so why was he charged an extra $4 at the restaurant? He decided to call them, but he was unable to reach anyone at the restaurant due to high volumes of callers. So he found the email address online and sent an email asking why the owner overcharged him. Shortly after, the owner replied, expressing apologies first, then explained that due to the rise in ingredient prices, the restaurant had to adjust the price of dish a few months ago. Except for appetizers, snacks, and beverages, all vegetable dishes were increased by $1. However, as the website was created by another company and they couldn't contact them in time for updates, it resulted in displaying the previous prices. Lastly, the owner apologized again for the confusion and assured that the extra $3 had been refunded to the professor's credit card. But this apology letter infuriated the Harvard professor. He wrote another lengthy email, starting with a focused attack. I ordered four Four dishes, each charged an extra dollar, so you clearly overcharged me four dollars. Why did you only refund me three dollars? Then he quoted a lengthy passage to suggest that this counted as intentional violation within the minor category and should be penalized three times the amount. In plain terms, whether it's three dollars or four dollars, it's too little. In your case, you should compensate me four times three, totaling twelve dollars. Finally, he emphasized his identity. I hold an active professor position at Harvard University, currently a professor at the business school, and possess a lawyer's license. The implication was clear. If you don't honestly compensate, I will sue you in no time and you will be in big trouble. Faced with the professor's aggressive stance, the restaurant owner chose to back down. Not only did he refund the requested $12, but he also urgently had the online prices updated and included screenshots of new prices in an email. We have acknowledged our mistakes and corrected it. Please spare our little business. However, this time the professor wasn't letting go. He sent another lengthy passage trying to position himself on the moral high ground. Who knows how much money you've already taken from other customers. Maybe you're deliberately not updating the prices online so you can take more money from the customers. In small claims court, your behavior constitutes malicious deception and could result in a minimum fine of $25. But since you're probably new immigrants unfamiliar with US laws, I won't push for more. Just give me a half price discount on my previous order, which is close to the minimum $25 dollar fine. Okay? This time, the restaurant owner exploded in anger and replied without hesitation, expressing that they had always conducted their business honestly and the price increase was due to overall inflation and unavoidable action. Customers who dined in the past few months had paid according to the new prices. He questioned the fairness of his asking, and even if they were to adhere to professor's meticulousness, $53.35, half of which would be $26.65, exceeding the mission $25 fine by $1.65. Hey, who was the one haggling over the $1 before? You're being hypocritical here. An old one also replied. Is this really worth your time? The email completely ignited the professor's anger. Not only did he file a lawsuit against Sichuan Garden, he also turned this experience into a scathing article of over 4,000 words posted on his university's website. To ensure that his masterpiece wouldn't go unnoticed, he even assigned it as homework for his students to read, instructing them to read and study thoroughly. 
and teaching them that no matter how small the infringement, that they should always be fighting for their rights. However, this maneuver backfired unexpectedly, mainly because this professor, in both teaching quality and interpersonal skills, was not well liked. Compared to other professors in the department, Professor Edelman was seen as aloof and unapproachable. For instance, some students mentioned being sent back to rewrite their essays merely for exceeding the required word count by four words. Others claim to have received the grade of C on their assignments without any visible corrections throughout. When questioned about their errors, the professor responded condescendingly, asking, If you don't even know the mistakes you made, how can I help you? This is the same person who's normally sparing with words by engaged in a week-long email battle with a Sichuan restaurant owner and producing 4,000 words in the process. And to top it off, he narcissistically invited his student to read his masterpiece and assigned it as his homework. He just wanted to show off the epic saga stemming from a mere $4. As a result, the students were not sympathetic. They saw it as nothing but petty behavior. They questioned why someone would make such a big deal over $4. Even poorer students working to pay tuition could tip more than that for a meal, let alone a professor who, if truly in need of money, could simply cook at home. Is this professor really in financial need? According to the information released to the media, he once charged $800 an hour for a minimum of 5 hours on the investment research report. Public record also shows that this professor owned a 3.2 million house in the Boston's affluent area. With such wealth, is it really worth the time and effort to haggle over $4 with a small restaurant owner, or is there something else to the story? The Boston Globe, always keen on digging into news backgrounds, naturally wouldn't let him off the hook. They discovered that this wealthy professor was a litigation enthusiast. As early as 2000, he sued two advertising companies in small claim court because they had sent a bunch of fax advertisements to him without his permission. Nowadays, such incidents might equate to telemarketing calls or spam emails, hardly worth mentioning. But over 20 years ago, with online sales just taking off, this case going to court was quite novel. Ben, young and spirited, coupled this with his fierce courtroom tactics, actually won one of the two lawsuits and was awarded $1,500 in damages. Although he technically won the lawsuit, he never received the money. The defendant was a tiny company who promptly filed for bankruptcy after the lawsuit, leaving the professor with nothing but a worthless piece of paper. However, it's not entirely accurate to say that he gained nothing from this experience. A year later, when he applied to Harvard Law School, he specifically mentioned these two lawsuits to demonstrate his deep passion for the law, indicating his destined path as a lawyer. Regardless of his character, one must admit that he is exceptionally intelligent. At just 26, he became an assistant professor at Harvard and three years later a full professor. Along the way, he not only completed four residencies but also passed bar exam and obtained a law license. His first act after getting licensed was to represent himself in court. In 2010, he led a lawsuit against Facebook uncovering a privacy bug that could potentially expose users' information to advertisers. Later that year, he sued Google for similar privacy concerns, as they could access personal data even after users declined to share it. Contrastingly, these giant companies usually have a huge team of active lawyers on roster. In both cases, despite his personal representation, both were dismissed before trial, leaving him to foot the bill for legal fees. After these failures, he realized that taking on these tech giants in courts was like trying to uproot a giant tree, so he began targeting softer targets. Office companies, cleaning services, car rental agencies. When using services from these small businesses, the sharp-eyed professor always managed to find loopholes in their contracts and often succeeded in claiming compensation. However, the amounts were usually small, ranging from tens to hundreds of dollars. Moreover, many of these businesses are run by first-generation immigrants, particularly of East Asian and South Asian descent. The main reason for targeting this group was due to their vulnerability. They're newcomers, they don't want to cause any trouble, so they would usually pay up. Many times, as soon as the other party hears them say, I am a lawyer, they immediately back down. It's not because they're afraid of going to court, but rather they see litigation as time-consuming and draining, wasting precious energy and time better spent elsewhere. They'd rather swallow their pride and pay up. For the professor, it's probably not about the money at all. It's more about the peculiar sense of psychological superiority he gains, feeling that he's intellectually outmaneuvered his opponent using his education and intellect, until he encountered this stubborn Citroen restaurant owner. Once these background details were revealed, not only did the intellectual circles at Harvard perceive him as someone who bullies the weak and dishonors academia, but even Harvard alumni began to feel ashamed of associating with him. Professor Alvin Roth, a Nobel laureate in economics and his colleague, 
expressed his opinion on Twitter, comparing Ben Edelman to an evil sheriff trying to portray himself as the epitome of justice in the wild west of the internet age. Unfortunately, he only dared to go after those smaller than him. Professors from Harvard Law School also publicly refuted him with their expertise. According to legal statutes, a minimum fine of $25 is only imposed in small claim court when the other party refuses to admit fault and compensate. Based on the email records provided by Professor Edelman, the restaurant owner not only promptly apologized multiple times within 20 minutes, but also voluntarily offered compensation. With this, the restaurant owner did not meet the criteria for a fine. On the contrary, Professor Edelman not only persisted in his aggressive tactics, but also took advantage of selectively quoting the law to threaten the other party. He is the one manipulating the law. Many people even compared Professor to that judge who wore flashy pants. That incident occurred in 2005 when a judge named Roy Pearson from the District of Columbia sued a Korean-owned dry cleaner for losing a pair of pants, demanding a whopping $67 million in damages. Was it because the pants had golden seams or diamond studded waistbands? Of course not. It was all about the judge being overly critical. The dry cleaner's advertising slogan, same day service, convenient and safe for your clothes, was deemed false advertising combined with the loss of the pants, allegedly causing him immense mental anguish, thus the exorbitant claim. This lawsuit, with its absurd reasoning and amount, was still accepted by the civil court due to his status as a judge. In court, the judge put on a dramatic performance, shedding tears and declaring that he couldn't live without his pants. However, regardless of his Shakespearean acting, the jury saw through it all. In the end, not only did the judge lose the case, but he also earned the title of Judge Fancy Pants, the judge who lost his case over pants. Because of this case, many legal professionals expressed their willingness to provide free legal services to the restaurant owner, determined to help him win the lawsuit and teach the professor a lesson for wielding his power recklessly on the innocent. Aside from all this, online discussions were also buzzing with curiosity about the four dishes the professor ordered. Some people on Reddit started threads specifically discussing the flavors of garlic chicken, spicy peanut shrimp, boiled sliced pork, and stir-fried cabbage, whether they tasted good or not. So some people would actually go all the way to Citroen Garden ordering these four dishes and take photos to upload them online. One of the captions read, truly delicious. No wonder the professor wanted to get two meals at the price of one. Meanwhile, a local company, without even tasting the food, handed over the entire order of their annual meeting to Citroen Garden, spending over $500 on takeout. The result? They received rave reviews, with colleagues saying that every dish was so tasty they wanted to lick the plates clean. Seizing this opportunity, the savvy restaurant owner Mr. Duan launched these four dishes as the professor's combo, offering special discounts to Harvard students. This promotion not only boosted the restaurant's business, but also enhanced its reputation among the students as being affordable and delicious. This petty drama prompted Harvard University to announce that they wouldn't renew the professor's contract, and the tenure he was supposed to receive was completely revoked. Another individual who distanced themselves from him was a family elder. When this scandal first broke out, there were online speculation about the professor's surname Edelman and his connection to Marion Wright Edelman. Speaking of Marion Wright Edelman, she was a well-known figure in the United States, not only a black activist and opinion leader, but also Mississippi's first black female lawyer. She founded the American Foundation for Child Protection, dedicated to safeguarding women, children, and other vulnerable groups. She even authored the book called The Measure of Our Success, A Letter to My Children and Yours, which was not only a must-read for many American high school students, but also translated into many languages. Because she's such a great and selfless woman, and there's a difference in color of skin, so people think that it might just be a coincidence that they share the last name. However, at this moment, Miss Marion issued a statement revealing that the professor's father's brother was her husband, and she only acquired Edelman's surname after marriage. In other words, Mary should technically be the professor's great-aunt. She mentioned that she only interacted with the professor briefly when he was young, and that he was bright and intelligent. Unfortunately, he veered off course. Instead of upholding justice, he became the tool for injustice. As someone dedicated her life to serving disadvantaged groups, she felt deeply ashamed and regretful of the professor's actions, and to lose tenure position over a mere $4, and to alienate oneself from others, ending up as the Joker nationwide. It's unclear whether the professor regrets his actions or not. Nonetheless, he posted another apology letter on his university's internal network. He claimed his attempt to sue the restaurant was an overreaction to seeing overcharging and that he didn't actually intend to sue Mr. Duan, the restaurant owner. However, even in his apology letter, his tone remained condescending, earning him another wave of negative reviews. 
After leaving Harvard Business School, he took short-term positions at several universities, none lasting more than two semesters. Wherever he went, he couldn't shake off the label of the $4 professor. Eventually, he gave up teaching and sought a position as an analyst at Microsoft. But do you remember his lawsuit against Google over privacy terms more than a decade ago? Despite humiliating defeat, that chapter of his litigious history was etched into the notebooks of Silicon Valley's major companies. So whenever his reports mentioned anything related to Google, they were automatically labeled with subjective bias bias and lack of fairness and were promptly dismissed. After a few incidents like this, Microsoft also concluded that the professor was blind. So he picked up his old job and started suing people. This time he sued Harvard University. He believed that Harvard's refusal to grant him tenure eight years ago was due to influence of public opinions instead of his teaching abilities. Therefore, he demanded compensation, or at the very least, a teaching position at Harvard. The case has been filed, but the trial date is uncertain. However, there's a chance Harvard might settle to avoid further controversy. By allowing him back to teach is out of the question. After all, the incident with the $4 has caused such a stir and embarrassment that students will probably avoid his classes like the plague. Additionally, in April 2022, Prof Edelman started suing the Emirates airline. Edelman ordered with points for a 2020 November flight back in 2019 December from Seattle to Dubai. The airplane tickets are for business class for the whole family, including his two sons who are four years old and seven months old. Then, under the effect of COVID, Emirates canceled the flight and extended the effectiveness of the plane tickets to 36 months. In 2022, when Edelman and his family wanted to use the tickets to fly to Dubai, Edelman's second son was already three years old, requiring adding more points for his tickets. Therefore, Edelman started another lengthy legal battle against the Emirates. It seems like suing people will be his forever passion, but at least this time he's picking a fight with a giant corp. What about the Duan family and Citron Garden? Unlike the destitute professor, they have steadily climbed the ladder of success over the past eight years. Unlike his father, who preferred food, little Duan was more inclined to work wine. So while managing the restaurant, he obtained a bartender's license and quickly became a shining star in the industry with his technical skills and imagination. He not only introduced signature cocktails to the Chinese restaurant, but also created various new ones to complement the spicy Citron cuisines. As a young second generation Chinese immigrant, he graced the cover of of renowned GQ magazine and was named Man of the Year in 2015. Seeing his son's excellence, Old One was at ease and allowed his son to completely renovate Citron Garden in 2018. Not only did they expand the facilities with a fully equipped bar counter, but they also gave the new establishment a trendy makeover catering to the preferences of young people. It was no longer the same old run-of-the-mill eatery. Despite the change in style, the prices remained reasonable. According to the menu, the average cost per person was $20, offering authentic snacks like dandan noodles and spicy wontons, as well as hearty dishes like boiled beef and sour cabbage fish, pairing them with a specially crafted cocktail made the experience even more enjoyable. After weathering the downturn brought by the pandemic, Citron Restaurant was ranked among the top 50 restaurants in Boston in 2021, and its small bar was voted the best for two consecutive years. Little Duan generously shared his secrets on his YouTube channel, teaching viewers how to make the restaurant's most popular specialty drink. Father's advice. In his words, the drink was deep and restrained, slightly bitter on the palate, but with a lingering sweetness, symbolizing the image of his father, Old Duan. He was not just a singer, a gourmet, a chef, or a loving father, but also a resilient and tenacious first-generation immigrant. Who would have thought that $4 ultimately changed the destinies of two people? One's path narrowed, while the other expanded spectacularly. It just goes to show that while the roll of dice may determine one's beginning, it is ultimately one's character that decides their destiny. Thank you so much for watching, see you next time.